like. Hello, Facebook. It's live. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see everybody today. Um, thanks for being here. I'm Pastor Kelly, as you know. Um, so uh, today is we're gonna finish. We're gonna finish at the Advent series, and uh, um, it's the end of the Advent series. It's uh, Jesus is born tomorrow. Um, not technically, but that's what we celebrated in America. Um, he, um, this club told me he was born in the spring, they believe. But you know what? We're in America. This is what we, we celebrate tomorrow. <laughs> so um, I want to start off with prayer. Then I, I want to get right into the message today, the last, the last message of Advent. All right, dear God, we just thank you for today, God. We thank you for everybody who could make it today, everybody who uh, could make it to, to Facebook Live. And God, I just pray that, God, that you bless today. You bless the message, God. And, and, and God, just pour into each one of us, pour into our spirit, God. Um, and, uh, and God, this is part of the transformation process, the sanctification process. God, I pray that we become more like you each and every day. So God, have your way with each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so, so we're going to finish with the Advent series today. And Advent is a four-week um, period where we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate the birth of Jesus. We do this because Jesus is worthy. Amen. Amen. Um, let's go to the, uh, the first book of Timothy. Um, the, first book of, the first book of Timothy, Apostle Paul tells us why Jesus is worthy. Because we want to know why he's worthy. First Timothy 2, verses 5 through 6 says, There is one God. And one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man's name is Christ Jesus. Amen. It says he gave his life, and this is, this is all part of why he's worthy. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Jesus, Jesus is the bridge between us and God. He reconciled our relationship with God, which had been broken. Before Jesus came, uh, we were separated from God by sin. We talk about sin. And this separation ended up causing a, a divorce. Everybody say divorce. 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 And a divorce is a is is it's a, it's the process of terminating a marriage or marital union. And sin caused a divorce between us and God. And the truth is, and this is up on the screen, the truth about is that many individuals and families and communities and nations have filed for, for, for divorce, divorce from God. Many people have filed for divorce from God. And, the, and, the, 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 and, and divorce is a natural reality of life. Divorce, you know, because when you hear people say they got divorced, it's always bad. You're like, man, it's like a, it's a, it's like kind of a taboo thing, but it, it's really a bad thing when two people who come together in unity, um, in front of God, when they divorce and they just they they leave and they part ways, and it can often cause emotional issues such as anger, hurt, confusion, depression, and even self blame. I don't know if you've known anybody who's been divorced before, but I know many people have been divorced, and it's not good. And it usually it affects the adults, but it also seems like it affects the kids even worse because kids don't know how to handle it. But the worst part of divorce is the loneliness of not being together with the other party. Amen. In the first divorce in history is when Adam sinned. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but that was the first divorce in history. Adam said, and after this event, Adam wasn't able to experience God like he used to experience God. And that's what happens when you get a divorce from somebody. You're not able to experience them like you used to experience them. And the Bible says that Adam and his wife, Eve, walked with God together in the garden. It says that. And this means, this basically means they had fellowship. Um, they had intimacy, but when sin entered into the world, the intimacy stopped. It, it, it came to a halt. In their proximity with God, it changed. Adam and Eve were ousted out of the garden. They were ousted, ousted out of paradise. It was perfect. It was perfect in the garden. And we know that when you're not around somebody um, like you used to be. The intimacy, the intimacy lessens, and you start losing touch, right? 
And sin caused us to lose touch with God. So Jesus came to reestablish the connection. And it's because of this reconnection that we truly, it's, it's, it's because of this reconnection that we truly know and experience God. We can't, you can't experience, you can't really truly know God and experience God without going through the Son first. Amen. And the obedience of Jesus, which the Bible says he learned, Jesus learned obedience. And that's something that like when uh, Lewis was teaching Hebrews, it's something that stuck out. Jesus learned obedience. Everybody say, Jesus learned obedience. So if Jesus had to learn obedience, that means that we have to learn obedience. And Jesus learned obedience, and he gave us full access because of his obedience to God, like Adam and Eve had in the garden, because of Jesus. That's why he's worthy. That's why we honor him. That's why it was a divine thing that he came. And let's turn to, let's turn to Luke Verses 20, uh, chapter 23, verses 44 and 45. And this is talking about this access. Everybody say access. It's always good to have access. We have a key, a key to our home so we can access it, right? If you lose your key to your house, to your car, you can't get in and you got to call somebody to let you in the door, right? And you got to pay money for it. Get a spare key. <laughs> Luke 23, verses, um, um, verses 44 to 45 says, By this time it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock, from 12 to 3, Jesus on the cross. Verse 45, the light from the sun was gone. It wasn't complete darkness, but it was, it was cloudy. It, was, it, was just, it wasn't light. And suddenly, the curtain, everybody said a curtain, in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Everybody say, torn down the middle. So the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. And you got to think about curtains. Curtains are used to keep things out. We shut the curtains, but we don't want light in. When it's in the summertime and we, we want to keep the heat from coming to our house because it's making us sweat. That's why we have ACs, though. We have ACs. But curtains serve a purpose. And... And during Jesus' time, the curtain kept us out of truly experiencing God. And only the high priest could enter into God's presence. But Jesus changed this. Amen. We can enter into his presence like we did at worship time. Like we, we can do it any time. And the tearing of the temple curtain signified two things. And I have these things up on the screen if you want to write them down. The first thing that is signified, man now has free access to God. Amen. We have free access to God. He goes wherever we go. Amen. We take him everywhere. We take him in. We take him to work. We take him to the, uh, to the doctor's appointments. We take him to gas stations. We take him when things are good and when things are good. He's with us all the time. Second thing that the temple curtain signified was the tearing of the temple uh, curtain signified was God is no longer confined to a temple made with human hands. Humans built the temple, but God didn't need a temple anymore. He's not confined to it. He's not in a box. We serve a God who's not in a box. People, you might put him in a box, but he's not a God who's, who, who, who naturally is in a box. Amen. And the tearing of the temple curtain, um, it basically meant that we can talk to God whenever we want to. You can talk to him right now. You can talk to him at home. You can talk to him when you're driving. I don't know if you do that. But sometimes I do. I don't know about you. We can experience God whenever we want to. We don't have to come to church. We can experience God in our living room, in the shower, on the toilet. It doesn't matter. We can, we can now go boldly to God's throne whenever we want to. This is the reason why he's, re he's the reason for the season. Amen. He's the reason for the season. It's not about gifts. It's not about spending time with family. All those things are blessings. But this is the reason for the season. Over the last past, uh, the past three weeks, we've looked at some things Jesus modeled to us while he was on earth. For the 33 years he was on earth. Jesus lived a life of hope. And peace and joy. And we talked about those three different themes of Advent. And hope, peace, and joy are part of the fruits of the Spirit. And the fruits of the Spirit are found in the book of Galatians, which I've read many times since, um, since the beginning of Advent. But we're going to read it one more time because I don't know when we get back to them. But it says, Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says, But the Holy Spirit... 
produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love. It's the Holy Spirit that produces love. It's not us. It's the Holy Spirit. God has to produce love. It's about, he produces joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the fruits of the Spirit are important because they help us in our sanctification. And sanctification, which it came up this morning, is the process of becoming more like Jesus. Becoming more like Jesus in the goal. Everybody say the goal. For every Christian should, should be to become more like Jesus each day. And we do this by the process of imitation. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1. It talks about this thing, this process of imitation. Now, um, starting with verse 1, it says, imitate God. Everybody say imitate God. Imitate, imitate God. Say it again. Imitate God. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> Imitate God. Therefore, in everything that you do, because you are his dear children. Apostle Paul tells us, he tells the church that we are to imitate God. Imitation is often called the sincerest form of flattery. Have you heard that before? Imitation is often called the sincerest form of, flat, of flattery. Because when you imitate someone, you want to be like them. You know when you're a kid, you want to be like somebody. You want to be like one of your superhero cartoon characters. So you put on a cape like Superman, but you can't fly. You, you put on, you, I don't know, different characters. I want to be a G.I. Joe's. You know what I'm saying? You, you're just you're a, war, a war guy. Just, it doesn't matter what it is, but you become, you want to be like that person, and you imitate them, and you often dress like them, you talk like them, and you have the, the same desires as that person. And Apostle Paul says that God wants us to imitate our life after his son. Powerful, isn't it? Powerful stuff, powerful words. And the truth is, is that Jesus is the greatest example and model of who we should imitate our life after. When Jesus came down to earth, over 2000, I'm saying like over 2,000 years ago, he brought heaven with him. Amen. Amen. He brought the fruits of the Spirit. He brought life. You're singing here because of Jesus. He brought holiness. He brought integrity. He brought peace. And these were all lacking on the earth. And we know the story. We know the story. There's a lot of people that have not walked in life with all those things, with holiness, integrity, and peace, and in a valley form, did it? But let's continue with Ephesians. Apostle Paul starts off the chapter telling us to be imitators of God. But verse 2 tells us how to do this. Amen. Verse 2. Ephesians 5.2 says... Live a life filled with love. Everybody say love. No. love. Love. Live a life filled with love. Following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered us himself, offered himself a sac as a sacrifice for us, pleasing and for us as a, a pleasing aroma to God. Apostle Paul calls each one of us to, to live a life of love. And, lo and love is the last theme of Advent. And the title of today's message is called The Greatest Love Story. The greatest love, greatest love Story. The Greatest Love Story. Let's pray and we're going to get into this message. All right, dear God, we just thank you for that. We do thank you for The Greatest Love Story. We thank you for actually being part of The great love, Greatest Love Story. We read about it, but we're part of it. We are spreading love in our life on earth. So God, I just pray that this message, God, just it just it just it just, it just motivates us and it really just it, it, it challenges us and it changes us to live a life centered around the imitation of your son. Especially today, we're talking about love. I pray that God that we that we learn how to love better. God, we just learn how to love like you do. Because human love is not godly love. So God, thank you for today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, love, L-O-V-E. It's a word that's been spoken by many. We often say love without really thinking about it. Do we? 
We often say it without thinking about it. Because people, if you think about it, people often say they love food. How many of you like a good donut? How many of you like a good taco? How many of you like a, a good, um, a, a nice cold um, uh, drink on a hot summer day? I would love, I love, a, I love a cup of water. We say we love sports. We say we love people. We even say we love ideas. I like the idea of that. I love the idea of that. We say those things. But in many ways, love has lost its potency. If you think about it, it's been used, it's been used so much and in so many situations that it's almost became, it's almost become watered down. It's almost, it, 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 I, I, and this is what God's been speaking to me for this, this message. It's almost like it's lost its strength and its purpose. It's a gift from God that has been twisted. I was thinking about that this morning when I got up. I, I, God was speak, speaking to me, and he was just like, you know what? Everything that I've made, everything that I've given my creation is good, but they twisted it. Somehow they retwisted. We have a, we have a tendency to, to just twist things, don't we? That's one of the reasons why Jesus had to come. He had to untwist us because we're like pretzels and God had to get us all unwrapped. But to many, to many people, um, love is a four-letter word used to get something from someone or gain access to something. And I know that we know this stuff. I know, I know I'm not just, I'm not, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. But we know that love has become self-centered. And and really, the society and the world's definition of love really is, what is it, it, what's in it for me? Think about it. What's in it for me? Um, and we know that that's not, that's not love. Because love is more of what you can get or what you can take. Amen. It's more than that. It's more than receiving flowers and candy or nice jewelry. Those things are nice, right? Those, but those things are called blessings, right? It's nice, it's good to be blessed, but it's better to be loved. But I want you to, I want you to, I want you to hear this. True love, true love is about sacrifice. True love is about being selfless, not worrying about yourself, but worrying about somebody else. And the Bible says in John fifteen thirteen that. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples about love. He tells us that the greatest display of love is giving up your life. And this is a pattern that we should imitate. Everybody say imitate. This is a pattern that we should imitate in our life. And many of us, we've never been asked to lay our life down, literally. I don't think I don't think anybody here has ever been asked. God has asked you go um, go die today. Maybe maybe he has, but but I know that God does ask us to give things up. He asks us to give up things in life for His kingdom. Amen. And this is something that I've been I've been trying to I've been trying to, God has been telling me and I've been I've been preaching about it and, and just trying to um, put in messages. God calls each of us, each of us, to a life of servanthood, servanthood, to a life of generosity, to a life of giving, to a life, and this is this is things that I've been I've been I've been talking about for for, for a couple years now. To to a life of using your gifts, your talents, talents, and experiences, gifts. Talents and experiences. But in order to use them, in order to imitate Jesus like he did when he was on earth, you have to, you have to be um, committed to sacrifice. You have to, be, you have to be committed, which only can happen through God and love. If you're going to use your gifts for the world, if you're going to use your talents, you're going to use your experiences. It's about love. Because love motivates us to use what God has given us for others. Amen. Because some of us here have gifts. We haven't tapped right into them. And I pray, I hope that after this sermon that you, that you feel motivated to use what God has given to you, what gifts he's given to you, what talents, what experiences. Because when you do that, you're imitating God. 
when you're, you're in it, imitating Jesus. But if you don't, you're keeping, you're being greedy. But the love of God can clearly be seen throughout history in the greatest love story in history. Because we are part of the greatest love story in history. Amen. Greatest love story. And when you think about it, the Bible is just one big love story. And it began in creation. When God, God created the earth and he put everything we need to live on it. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Everything that we need, God has given to us. We think we need more, but we have everything God that we need. And when God created the, the, earth, the earth, Adam and Eve didn't lack, they didn't live in lack. It was no, it was no poverty, po poverty mindset. It was no spirit of infirmity. They had everything that they needed. They had all their needs met. They had food. They had water. They had shelter. Those are basic, basic things we need in life. And they also, to put the cherry on top, they had God. But one choice ended this. They ended, it ended this. Sin entered into the world, and this caused separation between us and God. And Adam and Eve no longer lived under God's divine covering. And this didn't, this didn't stop God's love for Adam and Eve. After sin, after sin, God even, he, he showed his love for Adam and Eve after his sin, after they made a stupid decision. Genesis 3.21 says, and the, Lord, and the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. God made clothing to cover up Adam and Eve's nakedness. And you don't, if you don't love someone, you don't give them something, right? If you don't love somebody, you don't give some, you don't give somebody something. You're not gonna give something, you're not gonna give somebody a card. You're not gonna give something to somebody if you don't love them. God loved Adam and Eve, even though they made a bad choice to take the bait from Satan that led to sin. They took the bait from Satan. Because Satan, we have to, have to realize there, there's bait from Satan everywhere we go, in every situation. We can take the bait or we can just we can step over it. But God, it, God showed his love because he didn't cut them off. He could have cut them off, but he didn't cut them off. He could have been like, you know what, man, I'll waste, I mean, you're, you're, a waste, you're a waste of my creation. But he didn't do that. He didn't cut them off. This is because we serve a God who keeps his love on through the good and the bad. God loves us. Come on, man, we've all done some bad stuff before. We've all done some stuff that we shouldn't have done, but God still loves you. Amen. He loves you. And he's been doing this throughout history. When, when you read the Old Testament, God always loved the remnant. He could have destroyed, he could have destroyed Israel, the, the, his people, many times. He could have wiped out the creation. Noah. He, he, he said, build a boat. I'm going to keep, you know what, I'm gonna, you're not going to die. Build a boat. Do it the way I ask you to do it. You will live. And he did it, didn't he? He did it. Because he loved, he loved, he loves us. He loves us. But it didn't, it didn't stop there. It didn't stop, it didn't stop at creation. It didn't stop with Noah. God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to earth. He became like one of us. Like you. Look at your neighbor. Look at him. Look at your neighbor. He became like one of you. He, looked, he became. He had, he, had, he had skin. He had blood. He had, he had teeth. He had toes and fingers. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 10 says that God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Everybody say real love. Real love. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. He loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. It's real love. Sacrifice. Amen. When God sent his son to earth, it was the ultimate display of love. The ultimate display of love. The Bible says in John 3, 16, that Jesus is God's only begotten son. And the word begotten means one and only, one of a kind. There was only one Jesus. Right? Amen. There's only one Jesus. Amen. Only one and begotten son. That last song we sang about um, Singing, I'm sending his son, his only son, into the world for us. That was a good song. And the thing about it, the thing about it is God, God had one son, and he sent him down to be the sacrifice for our sins. We know this. We know this right here. We know this right here. 
Um, and this is up on the screen. I just want to make sure it's up there. This is the thing we have to realize. It wasn't God's sins or Jesus' sins. It was our sins. It was our sins. It was our doing. Eve, Adam, it was Adam. Adam chose to eat the fruit. Um, um, Eve was deceived. And lots of people throughout history, it's been their choice to sin. It's our fault. It was our disobedience. It was our issue. It's always been like that. Yet, he, cho he still chooses to love us through the sin. That'll make you think about how you how you love people in your life. If he, he, chose, he chose to live but love us through the sin, we're actively sinning, and and he still he still does he still chooses to love people through the sin. There's people right now that are in sin, but he loves them still. And you have to think about this. It's easy to love people when they're not in sin. It's easy to love people when they're doing the right thing. But what what about if they're sin if they're sinning they start sinning if their sins exposed. That's the, that's the true test of a Christian. Do you, can you love somebody through the sin? Can you love them through the lying, through the murder, through the adultery? Can you love, can you love that person through the sin? And we have to be real. We have to be real. We were born into sin and God still loves us. He still loves us even though we were born into sin. But this is why we have to, we should have a heart for the sinner. We used to be one of ourselves. Amen. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. And, and, and just tell him you used to be a sinner. You used to be a sinner. I used to be a sinner. You used to be a sinner. But it was because of God's love that I'm not a sinner anymore. It's only because Jesus, we're not a sinner. Amen. That should make you want to thank Jesus right now. Amen. I'm going to give him a hand clap or something like that. I'm saying, give him a hand clap or something like that. You should be thankful that, that because of Jesus, you're not a sinner right now. It was because of Jesus, it was because of Jesus that you're not a sinner right now. It was his obedience and it was his willing, willingness to die on the cross that we're not a sinner anymore. And he did it out of love. Amen. Amen. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I know it's not a lot of people here I'm saying this, I'm saying we know that this is a powerful thing. He did it out of love. It was because of God. It wasn't because of anything that you did. It wasn't anything that I did. It was because of what Jesus did. It was his willingness and his obedience to come down from heaven and come down to our earth, which we know is polluted and it stinks, and take the burden of sin and, 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 and die on the cross so we can have life. Amen. Come on. Come on. It's a good kind of this get a clap or something like that. This get a clap, man. See, that's the real powerful stuff right there. That's the real powerful stuff right there. I want to I want to turn to 2 Corinthians 5:21. It says, For God made Christ who never sinned. Man, we did. We, we did sin, but he made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin. So that we may be right with God through Christ. Woo! Man, that's, that's some good stuff right there. That's some good stuff. 33 years after he came, he died for us. He didn't have to, but he did. He did. And that's why he is worthy. That's why God, that's why Jesus is worthy. And he did it because of love. It, it's this love that we're called to. We're called to. God wants us. He wants us. I want you to listen to it. God wants us. Everybody say wants us. And expect us. Expects us. He wants and he expects us to love like his son Jesus did. I'm sorry. Right here, it's up on the screen. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just. All right. All right, here it goes right here. God wants us and expects us to love like his son Jesus. He wants and he expects. There are, I, I, like I've said before, I've said it probably 10 million times, that there is expectations and there are standards for being a Christian. And you cannot get out of them. You know what? You can't get out of them, but you know where, you know where you're going to end up? You're going to end up where it's really hot. Really hot. In eternal torment. You can do what you want to do and stuff like that. I'm saying I hope you don't, but I can't make a choice for you. God gives free will. 
But God wants us and expects us to love like his son Jesus did. And some people say, well, you know what? This is impossible. But it's not. Yeah, it's impossible if, if, you're, if you're looking, at, looking through human eyes and, and, and looking and doing it human, in human ways. But it's not impossible. It's not impossible. I want to turn to... I want to turn to Romans, the book of Romans. That's a good book right there. It says, Romans chapter 8, verses, starting with verse 9, it says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. Amen? Amen? You don't have to be controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. We have the, God, the Spirit of God in us. Amen. We're not controlled by the flesh. We're not controlled by the simple nature. That should make you happy. Happy, happy. Let's go to verse 10. It says, and Christ lives within you. So even though, you're, though your body will die because of sin, it's going to die because the body, the, the, the body has to die because of sin. The spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Thank you, Lord. Everybody say, Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. Let's go to verse. It gets better than that. It gets even better than this. It says, verse 11 says, The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. The Spirit, I'm just, I want to read that again. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. That's powerful right there. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living, in, living within you. <clears throat> At the moment of salvation, we're all, giving, we're all giving God's spirit. It's the same spirit that Jesus walked while he was on earth. Amen. And, this, and that just basically says that we, God loves us a lot. He loves us a lot, and that means that we can love like Jesus because Jesus never sinned. Jesus, you know, that's the thing. Well, uh, some people want to say different things, and they want to just like um, they want to just uh, um, say that the Bible is a lie. But Jesus never sinned. That doesn't mean it doesn't say that Jesus had honest, honest and tough conversations with people. He did. He had some really ones, some really big ones with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees didn't like Jesus, but Jesus still kept his love on. They didn't sin. They didn't sin. That's the thing. That's the thing. Jesus never sinned. But we, because we have the same spirit Jesus had when he was on earth, we, that means we can love like Jesus. And I want to turn to Philippians 4.13. I know some of you know this because you quoted, you quoted before in, in prayer, you quoted in different things. It says, for I can do everything. Everybody say, everybody, everybody say everything. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And this is encouraging when you think of everything Jesus accomplished and did it by living in a hostile environment with lots of haters. Haters. Everybody say hater. Okay, that's a funny word. It's a fun word. A hater is someone who discredits, devalues, or criticizes others without any valid reasons. They had no valid reason to they had no valid reason to do anything to Jesus. He lived, he, he lived a sinful, a sinless life, and he didn't do anything to anybody. They just hated him because he was bringing heaven down to earth. Do you understand? When you bring heaven down to earth, people are just going to hate you because they don't want heaven on earth. They just want earth. But we who are who have been bought with a price, we bring heaven to earth every day. Amen. But there was haters during Jesus' time on earth. Many haters. And these haters included the scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the chief priests, the elders, and Sadducees. They all hated, they all hated Jesus. But what it came, what it came from is that they were jealous. They were jealous of Jesus. And you have to be careful around jealous people. I don't know. I'm, I know there's. I know there's probably some in your life that, that that are in your families and stuff. They're jealous. They're jealous of you. They're jealous of the of the favor you have in your life. They're jealous of everything that you have. Oh, he didn't work hard. He didn't work hard for it. They didn't do anything for it. You got God's favor. In favor, people are going to get mad when when you have favor in your life. They're going to get real mad. They're going to get jealous. 
And I want you to listen to this. If a person cannot celebrate your successes and achievements, they're probably a hater. If something good happens to you and it's like they don't want to say nothing, they're just like, it's just like they're sitting there with a little stiff, stiff, probably a hater. <laughs> probably a hater. But the thing about Jesus is that he didn't come to earth to show up, to show off. You know what? You know, he, he did miracles. He, 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 he was fully God. He was fully human. But it's like he didn't come down to earth to show up or show off or try to boast about anything. Jesus came to do the will of his father. But he still had to deal with hate. But the thing about it, Jesus didn't hate them. And this is up on the screen right here. One of the, one of the true tests of love is loving someone when they don't love you back. Amen. Amen. When you love somebody and they don't love you back, that is a true test of godly love because it's it's hard with someone you, when you love somebody and you're just you have your heart's positioned towards them but their heart's not positioned towards you. That's that's rough. Because, and, it's, and it's easy to love someone when everything's going well in a relationship or at your job, but you know, but the moment that something starts going south, they start talking about you, they start bad mouthing you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do about those people that do that? And these are the times where I just, I swear, I swear this is, this is kind of a theme. Life is about choices. This is the time when you got to make a choice. Everybody say a choice. you got to make a choice in these times when things aren't going the way that you want them to go. You, you have two choices. You love like the world. And we know that the world doesn't love like God loves. You love like the world and you retaliate. Or you do things, you manipulate, or do you love like Jesus and keep your love on? And God wants us to operate in godly love. He wants us to choose godly love. Amen. And before we close, I want to read. I want to read from the book of 1 Corinthians. And this describes what godly love is and isn't. Because it's always good to see something, what it is, but it's also good to see what it isn't. It gives you like a really bigger scope, right? We want to have a big scope. We don't want to be narrow-minded Christians. We don't want to put Jesus, uh, God in a box. We know he can't fit anyway. But before I read these scriptures, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't want you to feel bad if you don't feel like you measure up to the biblical definition of love. Because godly love takes time. You got to think about we have a sinful, we, we're born in a sin, we have a sinful nature, and um, we don't always get it right, do we? Do we get it right? No, we don't get it right all the time. But the good thing about it is your relationship with, 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 with Jesus grows, when God grows, your godly love's going to grow. It's proportionate to your relationship with God. As your relationship with God grows, your ability to, to, to love like God wants you to love grows also. It's part of the transformation and sanctification process. Because I'll tell you right now, I'm sure you raise your hand. How many of you, uh, when you well, now you love better right now as of today um, than, than when you first came to Jesus? Raise your hand. And I put two of them up. I put my, both my legs and my arms up. So this part of the transformation process, the sanctification process of becoming more like Jesus and imitating him in every part of our life. That's, that's, that's what we need. That's what we're called to do, imitate Jesus. But let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is, this is talking about love from a biblical aspect, not from Dr. Whoever, like God, Dr. Whoever, Dr. John, Dr. Byron, I don't know. It says, 1 Corinthians 4, 13, verses 4 through 7, love is patient and kind. You got to be patient, kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Like I said, don't, don't leave here with condemnation. Just I'm saying, just take it in. Take heed. Love is, not, is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. Everybody say irritable. 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 And it keeps no record of being wrong. Everybody say, keeps no record. Keeps no record. Don't be, I'm saying, I hope I don't walk in your house and you got something in your refrigerator with a tab. Pastor made me mad. Poo, 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 poo. (laughs) 
Verse 6. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up. Everybody say never, never gives up. Everybody say never loses faith. Everybody say is always hopeful. And everybody say and, 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 and endures through every circumstance. That's a lot right there. You see how you see how that, that you cannot do that on your by yourself? We give up, we lose faith, we're not always hopeful, and we don't definitely definitely we definitely don't endure in every um, in every circumstance. Sometimes we just dig a hole and put our head in the ground like an ostrich. But that's not but God says, no, you you you, you can do this. Everybody say you can do this. You can do this. Point to your neighbor and say, you can do this. You can do this. <laughs> and I want to I want to I want to go to 1 Corinthians. And this kind of this is uh, uh, a little bit um, this is about love. Um, and, and, and Apostle Paul continues and talks about love. And he says three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Amen. And love is, and Apostle Paul said that the love is the greatest because it will continue. It will continue, even grow in the eternal state. When we go to heaven, it's going to grow in heaven. Our love for God will keep on growing. Our love for Jesus will keep on growing. And when we're in heaven, faith and hope will, they, they will have fulfilled their purpose on earth. Because we don't need faith when we see God face to face. Amen. When you see God face to face, you don't need you don't need faith. We won't we won't need hope when, when Jesus comes. Jesus is our hope. But when we get to see Jesus every day, we don't need any more hope because we're there with Him. He, 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 we're going to be standing next to the Mister. We're going to stand next to Jesus, which is hope. But we always we will always love the Lord in each other and grow in that love through eternity. Amen. Love. Everybody say love. love. All right. If you could bow your heads right now, I just want to pray. I want to pray for love for our congregation, for our church. Dear God, I just think we thank you for this Advent season, God. That this 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 the, the the end of our Advent season, God. This this message of love is powerful, God. We are caught to love. We are caught to love like like you love. We are called to be imitators of Jesus like when he was on earth. So God, I just pray that that this church, God, would be a place, a, 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 it would be a, a place where people feel loved. A place where when they walk in here, they just, they instantly, instantly feel like family. And God, help each one of us love better. God, love like you want us to love. God, I know it's said sometimes, some days, it's really hard to, to love when we've had a bad day and we woke up in the morning and we have a kink on our neck or, or we wake up and we have a flat tire or, or our, one of our family members is bugging us for money or something. <laughs> but you know what? You know what I mean, God. But just, God, just help us. Just help us, God. Be a, 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 be, help us, first of all, be loving individuals, God. Put the, give us, increase the, the love of God in, in each one of our spirits, God, because we know that Jesus did it, we can do it too. So God, thank you for just thank you for just loving us when some of us, you know, some like all of us have been unlovable at times and, and we might be unlovable in the future too. Sometimes we just don't do it. We don't we don't love you back like you love us. But God help us with this. We thank you, God. We thank you. Right now, um, right now I wanna I want to, I know, this is, I got to ask everybody, I got to ask people before you guys, at, at the end of every service, have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? Um, you know, that's my question to everybody here, everybody on Facebook, have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? The Bible says that Jesus is the only way to the Father. You must come to the Son in order to come to the Father. So what I'm going to ask anybody right now, anybody here, everybody on Facebook, have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? And if you haven't, I would, like you, I would like to offer you this opportunity for salvation. This is a salvation prayer. This is a, a prayer we, we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins and to come into our heart and start living for him. And that's lordship right there. So um, 
If this is you, and you're on Facebook right now, and if you want to make Jesus Lord of your life, I want you to repeat this, this prayer, this salvation prayer right now. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for forgiveness. Right now, I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that God raised him from the dead. Father God, fill me with your spirit so I can know you, serve you, and follow you the rest of my life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if this was you, you made the best choice in your life, you know. Knowing where you're going to be going is important in life because you have nothing to be scared of. You don't have to walk around in fear. Amen. Amen. Fear, fear is caused when you don't, when you, when you, when you're uncertain about things. But we know that we can, we can trust God. We're giving our lives to Him. We, you know, things that we do in our life, it's just we, we've given up our ways and we've done it. We're doing it God's ways. The moment of salvation. So we have nothing to be scared about. We have nothing to worry about. We have nothing to be scared about. Amen. That's a good feeling. Waking up every morning, just to say, you know what? If I don't, if I don't make it today, you know, I'm good. I'm good. I'm gonna say I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. All right. Um, we are going to. Um, for first of all, before we before we end up going, if you want, yeah. Um, I, I want to. I want. Does anybody have any prayer needs today? Any prayer needs? So. I'm just going to pray for the church. If we have no needs, I'm going to pray for the church. I'll pray for everybody who's on Facebook watching. Um, and we're going to sing one more last song before we actually go down. We're going to, I don't think I told anybody, we're going to go downstairs and we're going to celebrate Jesus' birthday. Okay? We celebrate our birthday. How many of you celebrate your birthday? Well, I'm saying, or there's something in your life. We celebrate, we celebrate like uh, anniversaries. We threw a 50th for the kings. <laughs> I'm saying we celebrate that. We want to celebrate Jesus' birthday because he is worthy of it, right? He is worthy. So we have, we have a, we're going to, it won't take a long time, but we, we're going to celebrate with a little sweet treat. Because I know, I know Jesus would want us to do this and on his behalf. And here comes the kids. Here they come. <laughs> Man, it's, it's good to hear kids here, isn't it? It's, here, it's good to hear kids. I want to hear more kids. Here they come. Come on. Come on down. Price is right. <laughs> All right, here they come. All right. So I'm going to pray. Um, if we have no, if we have no prayer requests, I'm going to pray. Then we're going to sing one more song. It's called a Christian Christmas Hallelujah. <clears throat> Christmas Hallelujah. Well, actually, let me ask the kids. Do you got any of you that just came up? Do you have any prayer requests or prayer needs? Do you have any, anything you need prayer for? Okay, just not ask them. Can't we can't forget about the kids? All right, so let's pray. Then we're gonna sing a song called Christmas Hallelujah. It's, one, it's a good song. Then we're gonna go downstairs and we're gonna eat something, some goodies, and celebrate Jesus' birthday. And I got something I want to tell you what Jesus revealed to me, um, or he, he spoke to me. I told you about it. Yeah. So, all right, if you bow your heads right now. Dear God, we just thank you for today, God. We thank you for this, for this, uh, for another opportunity to come into your presence, into your house. And God, I pray that um, t today was pleasing to you. God, uh, our, our prayers were pleasing to you at, at uh, pre-service prayer. Sunday school was pleasing to you. Praise and worship was pleasing to you. And the message was pleasing to you, too. So, God, thank you. Thank you for just... Being, where, being with us and going everywhere we go, God, we have nothing to fear because you are there with us at all times. So, God, thank you, and um, um, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for just coming to earth and being obedient. Like I said earlier, you were you had to learn obedience, and and you that's why you were obedient. You learned it. So, thank you for your obedience and your willing, willingness and commitment to die on the cross for something that you didn't do. It just it doesn't happen like that. But it, it was all it was all because of the love that God, your Father, has for He had for you. He has for us. So God, we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, let's start. We're gonna stick it up on there.